Hi class, today we are looking at chapter 3, lesson 2, how did early European settlers compete with one another and American Indians? Let's take a look. Competition among European nations. Spain, France, and England had different approaches to colonizing North America. Each nation's monarchy hoped that the New World would bring wealth and greater global power. The three major colonies employed different economic and governmental systems. The colonies of New Spain and New France appointed governors who reported back to the controlling government in Europe and carried out the king's and queen's orders. The English colony at Jamestown, on the other hand, was governed in its early years by a group of people who were elected to represent each settlement in the colony. The three nations competed for land and trade. Spain and France also sought to convert native people to Catholicism, the primary religion in those countries. And if we zoom out here, we can see that there's a picture here. And the caption reads, An early map of Quebec City in modern-day Canada. Let's take a look at our timeline here. So we have 1545. Spain finds the largest silver deposits yet discovered in the Americas. 1608, Samuel de Champlain founds Quebec City. 1649, the Iroquois Confederacy defeats the Huron Confederacy in the Beaver Wars. And 1718, Jean-Baptiste Le Mayon de Bienville founds the city of New Orleans. Spain established territories in South America, the Caribbean, Central America, and Mexico, as well as the southern and western parts of North America. Spanish settlers quickly learned to use the resources of their new colony to increase the wealth of Spain. The Spanish did not want land in the Americas to be taken by the French or the English. So, to further expand, Spanish rulers offered large portions of land to those willing to move to New Spain. These areas, called Ecomendas, included any American Indian villages on the land. The American Indians living in the Ecomendas were forced to work for its owner in exchange for housing and food. While the English relationship with the Powhatan in the Jamestown colony involved some instances of cooperation, Spain's relationship with the American Indians was based on conquest. The Spanish also wanted to convert all native peoples to Catholicism. New Spain's wealth and power came in part from its gold and silver mines. Spanish settlers also built ranches and sugarcane plantations. Many of the workers in the mines and on the plantations were American Indians. Disease, mistreatment, and dangerous working conditions resulted in the deaths of 24 million American Indians in just 100 years. To replenish the shrinking workforce, the Spanish brought slaves to New Spain. By 1570, more than 200,000 Africans were enslaved on the plantations of New Spain. And if we take a look at the picture here, we see the caption reads that a mission it was a common type of settlement in New Spain. One Spanish colonist named Bartolomé de las Casas was so upset at how the colonists were treating American Indians that he decided to help them. He became a missionary or a person who teaches his or her religious beliefs to people with different beliefs. Eventually, Many more missionaries from Spain came to the Americas to teach the native peoples about Catholicism, but rather than helping the native peoples, the Spanish missionaries forced them to work and give up their own religion. These native peoples and Spanish missionaries lived in settlements called missions. As Spain began claiming the West Coast, these missions became part of their strategy to prevent Russia and England from settling land in present-day California. Let's take a look at the map here. So here we have North America in 1700. And if we look here at the key or legend, we see the red is the British lands. The green is the French lands. Quite a large area here. Spanish lands would be in orange and disputed or unclaimed by the Europeans would be this area in here. And you can see there's a tremendous population difference between New France of 15,000 people, the 13 colonies, 
of 250,000, and New Spain with 5 to 7 million people. French Trappers and Traders When the French settlers began to colonize North America, they were interested in finding gold and a route to Asia. Their settlements along the St. Lawrence River in Canada would not help them with either of those goals. What Canada did, it, Canada did offer was many fur-bearing animals. The forest of Europe had been overhunted, but Europeans still desired hats made from beaver fur. To meet European demand, French settlers began to export beaver pelts across the Atlantic. The money raised through the fur trade helped pay for more expeditions into North America. As French explorers continued to explore Canada, the King of France wanted to organize the colony to ensure it made money. He chose Samuel de Champlain to lead New France. In 1604, Champlain sailed to New France as its first governor. Champlain's strategy in North America differed greatly from that of the Spanish conquistadors. He felt that building friendly, friendly relationships with groups of American Indians would lead to successful trade. He believed these alliances would allow him to travel freely and keep the French settlements safe from attack. Within his first year in New France, Champlain learned to speak the Huron language. New France and the nearby Huron and Algonquin groups traded with each other and maintained friendly relations. Primary source. Remember, primary source means it's the words of the person who said it. So this is from a diary entry, uh, Samuel de Champlain. So it's from him himself in 1609. So this is what he said. We departed on the following day, pursuing our way up the river as far as the entrance to the lake. In it are many beautiful low islands, covered with very fine woods and meadows, with much wildfowl and animals to hunt, such as stags, follow deer, fawns, roebucks, bears, and other kinds of animals which come from the mainland to these islands. All right, let's take a look at the next page. Marquette and Juliet. French explorers' efforts to find the Northwest Passage led them to further explore North America's waterways. In 1673, Jacques Marquette and Louis Juliet headed south in a canoe on the uncharted Mississippi River, they encountered many groups of American Indians living on the banks of the Mississippi. While some American Indians were hostile, the Illinois and other groups helped Marquette and Juliet. Marquette and Juliet claimed the land drained by the Mississippi River for France. Marquette later set up a mission in present-day Illinois, and Juliet continued to explore North America. La Salle and Louisiana in 1682, René Robert Cavier, Sieur de la Salle, or oh, that's a name, led an expedition down the Mississippi River. La Salle claimed the Mississippi and its tributaries or smaller branching rivers and streams for France. He named the region Louisiana after the French king Louis XIV. La Salle wanted to build a fort at the mouth of the Mississippi and attack the Spanish in northern Mexico. Asale and several hundred settlers, however, got lost and ended up in present-day Texas. By 1687, only 36 of La Salle's settlers remained alive. And here we have a picture, and the caption under it says, Bark canoes were sturdy enough to withstand ocean waves and light enough to be carried. All right, let's take a look at the next page. New Orleans. French colonists slowly began to settle parts of the Louisiana Territory. They built forts in strategic locations to protect new settlements from the Spanish and English. Louis XIV instructed a Canadian naval officer, Pierre Lemon, Sieur de Libreville, to build forts at the mouth of Mississippi. The series of forts he built in present-day Mississippi and Louisiana further established Louisiana as a French possession. One such fort, Fort Le Boulet, lay just south of the future site of the city of New Orleans. When he died of yellow fever, Leberville's younger brother, Jean-Baptiste Le Mayon Sieur de Biniville, continued his work. And here we have a picture, or actually a drawing, I should say, and it says the Port of New Orleans. Ships anchored at the Port of New Orleans about 1800. 
in their words. So another primary source. Here's what Pierre Le Monnier, Sieur de Liberville, look like. It says, if France does not take possession of this part of America, which is the finest, to have a colony strong enough to resist those that England possesses, these colonies, which are becoming very extensive, will increase to such an extent that in less than a century, they will be strong enough to seize upon the whole continent of America and to expel all other nations. All right, so he was planning ahead. He foresaw a future where France would rule all of North America, which, yeah, that didn't happen. Okay, we'll get to that later. Right now, let's get back to this. So, in 1701, Bienneville became governor of Louisiana at the age of 21. He built Fort Louis on Mobile Bay and lived there until 1711. In 1718, Bienneville founded New Orleans. The Louisiana Territory was much easier to farm than the rest of New France. Settlers built plantations on the fertile soil and grew indigo, rice, and tobacco. Successful plantations brought in more money from trade with the American Indians, which allowed the farmers to increase the size of the plantations. The growing plantations required more and more workers. In 1720, a ship carrying about 200 slaves landed in New Orleans. In the decade that followed, the colony imported more than 6,000 slaves. Eventually, more than half of the people of New Orleans were slaves. New Alliances, New Conflict As European colonial powers sought to rapidly expand in North America, they came into contact with more and more natives' people. Reactions to the Europeans varied. Some groups of American Indians were friendly and some were hostile. Before the Europeans arrived, the people living in North America already traded with one another, had military agreements, and shared cultures. The settlers' arrival often complicated the existing relationships between groups of American Indians. In 1609, Huron and Algonquin leaders approached Samuel de Champlain asking to form a military alliance. The Huron and Algonquin had long been enemies of the Iroquois. Eventually, Algonquin commanders convinced Champlain to lend them French troops in their fight with the Iro Iroquois. The Iroquois armies did not yet have guns or gunpowder. As a result, Champlain's men easily defeated the Iroquois. To thank the French, the Huron and Algonquin helped grow French fur traders' businesses in the region. After the battle with the Iroquois, France formed a permanent alliance with the Huron and Algonquin. The Iroquois Confederacy, meanwhile, sought revenge. And here we see a picture of a colonial trading post. You can see it's right on the edge of the water, and that's because there were no roads. So boats were the primary way they would move goods around. All right, let's take a look at the next page. Here we have a picture of French soldiers fight alongside Huron warriors. The Iroquois' chance came in 1634 when a smallpox outbreak weakened the Huron Confederacy. Smallpox was a disease brought to North America by the Europeans. At the same time, beaver populations in Canada dropped significantly. Historians believe that this was the effect of the overhunting of the animal by fur traders. Because of the beavers' role in the conflict, the war between the Iroquois, the French, and and the Huron and Algonquin Confederacies is called the Beaver Wars. In 1642, the Iroquois blocked the Huron from ha accessing the rivers they used to trade with the French and other natives' people. The Huron economy had become dependent on trade. The Huron nearly starved as a result of the Iroquois' blockade. By 1649, the Iroquois had defeated the Huron. The Iroquois' conflict with the French and the Algonquin would continue well into the 18th century. Resources from the New World in Rich Europe Though many French explorers were disappointed to not find gold in Canada, they did discover another valuable resource. People across Europe were fond of hats made from pelts or the skins of animals with the fur still on it. Unlike North America, parts of Europe were overpopulated. 
Some of the continent's forest had been cleared to expand cities. The larger animals that lived there became rare. Meanwhile, the large animals thrived in North America. The French colony made money by hunting and trapping mammals, such as moose, elk, deer, and caribou. Beaver fur held special value. European clothing makers used the beaver's thick fur to make felt, which is a smooth, leathery fabric. Beaver hats were especially popular in the cold winters of northern Europe. And oil naturally produced by beavers was even used to make perfumes. Hat makers had long used the fur of the European beaver to make hats, but overhunting and habitat destruction caused that species to become scarce by the 17th century. French traders were able to replace European beaver fur with an American version. Just as in Europe, American beaver numbers decreased significantly as a result of overhunting. The animal was eventually saved by a change in fashion trends. Silk prices dropped at the beginning of the 19th century, and Europeans exchanged their beaver hats for silk ones. This allowed the beaver population to make a comeback. Today, beavers are one of the most important national symbols of Canada. And here we have a picture of a woman wearing a dress and, yeah, animal fur. It says European clothes makers regarded beaver fur as fashionable and useful material. And today, it's not really fashionable. Nobody wears animal fur really anymore. All right, let's take a look at the next page. In the 1500s, Spain rose to become one of the world's most powerful empires. Its American colonies were key to the empire's growth. Spanish colonists mined large amounts of silver and gold in South America and Mexico. In 1545, Spanish colonists exploring in the mountains of Peru found the largest silver deposits yet discovered in the Americas. From American gold and silver, the Spanish made coins. Silver and gold coins were important to Spain's economic success because Spain produced very few goods that could be sold to other countries. Spanish traders exchanged coins for foreign goods. With this new wealth, the Spanish built ships and armies to further expand the Spanish Empire. And here we have a picture of two ships. We have a man of war and an admiral's ship. You can see the man of war, well, considerably bigger than an admiral's ship, but the admiral's ship is smaller, so it's more maneuverable and can move around a battlefield to see what's going on easier. All right. Here we have another picture. So we have a vice admiral's ship, cargo ships, and again, compared to the man of war, the man of war is going to be the biggest. And kind of like what the name says, man of war, it's out there for war. Okay. Other European powers tried to prevent the growth of Spain's territories. French leaders hired private sea captains to attack Spanish treasure ships as they returned to Spain. Eventually, Spain's dominance came to an end. The value of gold and silver was based on the fact that these metals were very rare. As more and more gold became available, Spanish coins were not as valuable as before. Nations that produced goods began to catch up with Spain economically. Without the ability to buy armies to protect and expand its empire, Spain's influence in the world shrank. In the 1700s, England, France, and the Netherlands fought to take Spain's place as Europe's most powerful nation. All right, boys and girls, again, as always, if you missed anything, go back, re-listen to the video, reread from your book, and I hope to see you soon.